Hello, my name is Maria Abreu. I'm a medical stu student working with Wisconsin Voices for Recovery to bring you Saturday Night Chat. Saturday Night Chat is a monthly chat that creates a space for people to share their recovery journey and to show people in and seeking recovery that they are not alone and that recovery is possible. Today, we'll be hearing from Patrick Pellet, who is here to give us a little bit about his, his story. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Maria. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm so grateful that you signed up because your story is so amazing, especially what um, you're doing now. So I know that a lot of people will be touched and moved from hearing your story. Um, so why don't you start telling us a little bit about yourself and your story with recovery? Sure. Um, so my name is Patrick Pellet. I am a substance use counselor um, in Clark County. I've been originally from Wisconsin, born in Baraboo, went to high school in Verona, um, and I was in the Northwest for about 20 years. Um, I've been in recovery a long time, um, but I've only been doing this job uh, about five years. So when I came back to Wisconsin, the credentials didn't quite line up. So I'm now the world's oldest trainee, which which is fine uh, because it doesn't change what I do. And I, I absolutely love my job. Um, I'm so blessed and grateful I get to come to work every day and I get to do this job. Yeah. So I guess, um, oh, go ahead. Did Go ahead, Maria. Well, I was going to ask, um, how did your recovery process start? Okay. So um, I started early. Um, I was uh, 15 years old. And by the time I was in my late time, was 15, 16, um, I, I was drinking like a full grown man. There had been some trauma um, and some different things. And about that time, I started attaching hyper masculine tags. So um, I was in the Marine Corps. I rode with Recovering Bike Club. Um, I've been in boxing gyms most of my life and, um, a lot of violence when, when I was drinking and, um, so I survived it, um, got married, um, had a beautiful, beautiful little daughter. And, and that's a story in itself. So I, uh, my wife was at the time, uh, was pregnant and, I figured she wasn't going to have the baby that night. So I went out and I got pulled over for a OWI. Um, I called from the South, uh, South Madison police department to, um, for her to come bail me out. She had some pretty pointed comments, um, and said, I'm having this baby. So because of my alcoholism and my drug use, I had, the one thing I really cared about at the time was my daughter. Or I didn't know it was going to be a girl. Those tests weren't as common back then. So I didn't know if it was going to be a little boy or a little girl. All I cared about was 10 fingers, 10 toes. Um, but I missed it. Um, I missed hearing her take her first breath. I missed hearing her cry for the first time. I missed holding her brand new into the world. Um, and... That was, I think we all hit these crucible moments, right? These moments that are so profound and so impactful that we have to take a look. And it's like, do I want to continue what I'm doing here? And so later that year in August, um, I needed help. So I went to somebody that I knew um, that she, her husband had been in recovery for quite some time. She had worked with my mother um, at the church in Verona. And um, she kind of set it up for her husband to come and get me. And he took me back to my first meeting. So I had been um, in treatment while I was in the Marine Corps. Um, not something they usually did in 1979. Um, I'm grateful because it kind of planted the seed. I knew where I needed to go to get help. Um, but what's unusual about being sent to treatment, um, in 1979, I look at how treatment is now and what we do, and it was very different. It was just AA meetings around the clock, um, and the hot seat, um, which you had a bunch of Marines and airmen and Navy folks, um, and you're in the middle and, and kind of taking, it's, it's a, it's a difficult process to go through. So I called for help, um, 
we showed up at the church where my mother worked and I walked in and back then Verona was still a really small town. And when I walked in the room, I knew everybody in the room. Um, and I was like, ah, crap. Now everybody knows, right? Like, like they didn't already know. I'm, there's a lot of places on the West side in Verona. I couldn't go in. I'd walk in and they just tell me to turn around and leave. Um, did pretty well. Um, relapsed about two months later. Um, the day before I got a job at the post office, um, I spent about three days. Um, I had a row route and it was a really good job, right? So I was opening the door, delivering mail and throwing up for about three days. It was, I think there was, I don't know if it was withdrawals cause I had some time, but I was really sick. Um, and at the time, before I went to that meeting, um, my uh, my ex-wife was more or less saying, you know, clock's ticking on your behavior. Um, and I remember talking to my folks and they said, we love you, which was, I think, really important. Um, but you can't stay here um, the way you are right now. You can't stay here. And so I, I heard that, but I also heard that I loved you. Um, which was really, really important for me at the time. Um, so I got the job at the post office. Um, I joined a, re um, a recovering motorcycle club. It was something. So one of the things I always tell folks is if you're passionate about something, if you have really something that gets you fired up, right? Um, rock climbing, um, sure. golf, uh, softball. If you look around and you're close enough to a larger urban area, you can probably find folks in recovery doing it. So the story I like to tell is on uh, Park Street, the south side of Madison. I can't remember the name. I think it was Park Lanes. They had like 25 or 30 lanes. And every Friday night, they had a sober bowling league. All the alleys were full. Um, and it was almost surreal, right? There was no cocktails or beers down on the tables by, by the lanes. Um, and that's just what you do, right? You, you have a beer, you have a cocktail, and you throw a ball and hope it stays in your lane, right? Um, so I would always encourage somebody, whatever your passion is, um, jump into it and find folks in recovery that are doing it. Okay. Certainly. I'm sorry, go ahead. I will say, even if there's not a group, you can form a group. And I'm yep. sure a lot of people will have interest. There's a lot more people in recovery than I think people realize. Um, you know, it is a disease. It's biological. It's what sometimes I think there's stigma about it. Um, but there is so many people that would love, probably have similar interests and would love to be with people in recovery with that specific interest. So if there isn't a group like that, you know, you can form one yeah. um, you have a couple things to say just from what you've mentioned so far number one I think I do agree with you when you say that a lot of people reach that point where they have that one moment where they realize kind of how bad it's been and kind of have a yeah. wake up call. but it's a really difficult thing to really hear that wake up call and do something about it and I just want to give you props because getting to that moment and just immediately being like, I need to change this, that takes a lot of strength because it is hard. And I think um, that's just something that I wanted to mention. Um, also, just as a side note for anyone listening, if you are, um, if you want to go through recovery at, in terms of alcohol, please reach out to a doctor or go to the ED because withdrawal symptoms, like he was mentioning, can be intense. So it's good yeah. for to have someone to be there through that process. There's also like outpatient centers where you can withdraw in a safe environment. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is more of a question towards you. Looking back, how, how does it feel feel when your parents had to draw that line with I love you but you can't stay here I think you know because I think a lot of people who have um family members loved ones who are in the process that they don't know how to draw that line how do you look at it look um when you're reflecting on it yeah um I think what I heard more than anything I was disappointed um 
but my parents had been so good for me. My my father had significant problems with alcohol, um, but he's still the best man I know. And I know how rare that is. It's very rare. But I heard we love you, but right. Um, and and that's what I kind of hung on to. Um, Maria, if if I can piggyback off something you just said that I think was mm -hmm. so we talk about a disease. First of all, alcohol, if you're withdrawing, there's there's two substances that'll kill you in withdrawals. It's alcohol and benzodiazepines. Um, don't try to detox on your own. Go and have it medically managed. Um, I It's a little bit more difficult here because we're in central Wisconsin and you have to drive three to four hours to find a detox center. Um, it's one of the things I would love for our legislature um, to address is to make that more accessible. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later with an individual I worked with earlier this year. Um, so, so it's really important. The other thing that you had mentioned, Maria, that I think is I really want to hammer home about stigma, right? This, this is a disease and there are significant changes to the brain. Um, and I can talk about the reward ways being hijacked, the reward pathways being hijacked. Um, the connection to our executive functions is a little bit tenuous. We're driven by um, survival instincts, right? So one of the things um, that happens, and we think about what we need to survive, food, water, shelter, sex, um, Drugs and alcohol get put to the top of that hierarchy. They get put in a place where they don't deserve. So um, when people are saying it's a choice, um, I I like I kind of like to take that on a little bit. Um, it is a choice the first time I pick up. But what I don't have a choice on later on, I don't have a choice about withdrawals. I don't have a choice about cravings and urging urges. And that's real suffering. That's real pain. Um, it, it really is. That's what I was mentioning about how, you know, it's a choice to want to make that change, but that change is going to be a hard process and not to dissuade anyone from wanting to go into recovery. It's really important, but it is important to know that it's, it's a hard process to go through, but that's why it's, it's just so admirable when people achieve it because mm -hmm. Um, as someone who in the medical field has seen people go through it, I've seen how bad it can be and just have so much admiration for people who go through uh, the process because it's not just wanting to make that change, but then staying, kind of sticking to that change. But yeah, it's hard because you really can't control how it's been or sometimes, you know, people around you might not be as supportive and that can make it hard. Yes. Um, but anyone listening, please reach out to our organization. We have resources, people you can talk to. It doesn't mean you have to go through recovery if you're not, um, if you don't want to, but if you're interested in hearing about it, learning about it, talking about with people that have gone through it, you know, there's people as amazing as Patrick here who have made it their life's mission to support you. Um, and it's just really moving yet. Um, speaking of support, um, yeah. Maria, can, can I tell a quick story? One of my favorite stories I love to tell. Of course, go ahead. So um, there was a, a man, Joe, who was walking through the park one day and he fell into a hole and it was a deep hole. It was about 10 feet. And he, you know, one of those deals where you try to climb out, you're just bringing more dirt in on yourself. And so he was down there most of the morning and um, his priest walks by and he yells up the hall and he goes, hey, fodder. He said, I've fallen down this hole and I can't get out please help me. And the father throws him down a blessing and, and keeps walking. And he was like, man, that's not help. So a doctor walks by and he goes, doc, he said, I'm so happy to see you. I've fallen down this hole and I, I can't get out. Can, can you help me? And the doc goes, sure. And he writes him a script and throws it down the hole. Mm -hmm. and, and Joe is really, he's been down in this hole for a while now and he wants to get out, but he doesn't know how to get out. And Joe's buddy walks by, Charlie, and he yells up, he goes, Charlie, he goes, holy smokes, I've been down in this hole all day long. I haven't been able to get, get out, and nobody's given me a hand to get out. Charlie goes, no problem, I got you. Charlie jumps in the hole with him. And Joe goes, you idiot, now we're both stuck down here. 
And Charlie goes, no, we're not. I've been down here before. I know the way out. Take my hand and follow me. And and that's what we do for one another in recovery, right? I'm I I have been with. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I love that metaphor. It's just so powerful. Yeah, it is. And um, those of us in recovery, we're not heroes. I'm not a hero, but I've had that done for me. I've had people hold me up when I couldn't do it myself. And the one the one thing um, I wanted to talk a little bit about understandings that we all have is. We all have different experiences, um, different genders, different ages, generations separate us sometimes. But the one thing we all have in common that binds us all together is everybody in recovery has an intimate understanding of pain, suffering, and loss. And that is where that connection happens. Um, I can sit down with somebody and say, I know how hard this is, right? I, I do know how hard this is. I know how much this hurts. Trust me and believe me, on the other side of this, it gets better, right? Um, the other thing too, about, um, we were talking about the brain science. I, I just wanted to make this point that I'm old enough that there's still a lot of stigma. Um, but there was a lot more 45 and 50 years ago. And this disease is not a character flaw. It is not a moral failing. You are not broken. It is a brain disease. The AMA recognized alcoholism as a disease in 1956, addiction as a disease in 1986. Um, it is recognized by the AMA as a disease to be treated like any other disease. Diabetes, we, we do not throw people in jail because they can't get their blood sugar in line. Right. So I know that seems kind of an extreme example, but um, so I forgot where I was at. That I just I love that story so much. I always lose track of where I'm at because I get really emotional when I tell that story. It makes so much sense because there's only so much support a doctor can give. Right. Yes. They'll try to point you in the right direction. They'll try to give you the right resources. But being able to have someone with you that knows exactly what you're feeling, he hasn't just seen it, but has experienced it, knows yeah. it can feel, knows how hard it is to get up that hill, but then can help you in the way, it can help you up and also promise you that you can get up that hill, that you can yes. get out of that hole. Um, yeah, so I really like that metaphor. And so what we could do next is, we talked a little bit about your story and how you ended up starting your recovery process. How did you, end up wanting to help people. I know that you've talked a little bit about it in regards to your metaphor and also how you had people help you, but how did that process get started from right. to then being like kind of like the mentor? Right. And um, thank you, Maria, for asking that because I, lo I love telling this part of the story. Um, so i have been in recovery a long time, but there was a long stretch where I wasn't working a program of recovery. Right. And to me, working a program of recovery is about growth, emotional growth, spiritual growth, growth. Right. Um, and when I do my gratitude list, I'm in the morning um, about once a week, every couple of weeks. I'm grateful for being an alcoholic and an addict because it's pushed me to understandings that I have to have in order to stay sober and stay alive that I wouldn't have if I didn't have this disease. So I'm grateful for this. So. There's, there's being sober and there's being in recovery, right? And I know which one I prefer. I know where my joy and peace and happiness is. Um, it's it's working a program of recovery. And since I moved back to Wisconsin, I'm very fortunate. I have this fantastic group in Nielsville um, that um, the AA group, a lot of a lot of old timers, um, and I've learned so much from them. And that's the other thing about recovery is I want to be coachable. I want to be teachable, right? I want to learn more than what I know now. So how did I, how did I get to this? So when I moved out West, um, I connected with a gal and probably the first healthy relate. My sister tells me it was the first healthy relationship I'd, I'd ever had. And it was glorious and it was wonderful. And I'm so blessed. And I learned so much from her. She was a social worker and I learned a lot that I didn't learn in school. And then, yeah, especially about trauma and how trauma affects us going forward with, with substance use. So, um, so about a couple of years into it. So 
we we had been kind of long distance dating and she got a diagnosis of colorectal cancer and i kind of had to make a decision I, I lived a little over an hour hour and a half away um so i made a decision i moved up i cared for her she had some disability coming in um from where she had worked and i drove her to treatments i i took care of the laundry, the dishes I cooked, and just for her to heal and go through this process. She was on chemo and radiation. Um, and in March, we got the diagnosis. She was free and clear. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Um, it came back about a year later, um, and it was stage four. And by this time, it had already been into her liver. Um, and pancreas and, and some other organs. Um, so that three months, her wish was to stay in her bed as long as she could. And, but I want to back up and answer your question. I'll, I'll get to how this ends. But so the disability was running out. Um, and I started um, looking for jobs. And the ones I was looking at was in a landscaper mowing laws, sweeping floors, nothing wrong with that. It's honorable work. But she kind of <laughs> gently said, you know, with your education, I, I had a degree and I almost finished graduate degree in anthropology. She said, uh, in your experience in boxing gyms, you worked with tough kids. Have you thought about this? And she held up an ad for an inpatient um, treatment center for teenage boys. And I said, I, I don't know if what I know is gonna gonna work. I, Maria, I never saw myself doing this work. Um, if she hadn't have been in my life, I probably wouldn't be doing this work. I never saw this, and so her response was, "I I don't know if this is gonna work." I loved her response. She goes, "If it doesn't work, you know, always sweep floors and cut grass. You that'll always be there for you, right?" So, and again, I'm not dismissing that type of work. It's honorable work. There's nothing wrong with that. So, I. I started the job and instantly felt like this is where I belong, right? Working with these these young men, boys, um, trying to figure this out. Cause I'd been, I hadn't been in treatment when I was 15 and 16 years old, but I had been in rooms like the one I'm in today. Um, so nine months later, I was a um, facility supervisor at a co-occurring um, facility. And so, as our story went along, and I'm going to go back to the Joe story with support. Um, we were able to keep um, Di in her bed until about a week before she passed. Um, and I just, it, I had so much love and support. Um, in particular, I had one friend that used to call me almost every, every day or every other day. How you doing? How are things going? You know, and I, I was I was a little salty because I didn't want to talk to him. I was like, didn't I tell you to off yesterday? You know, he says, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you did, but I'm just checking in. How are you doing? And this is the kind of love and support that I had. Um, about six months later, I uh I was at breakfast with a friend of mine. Um, and one of these guys that talk like this, right? And real direct, real straight guy. And I I love him, real straightforward kind of guy. And I was going on about how bad my life was, that I had this love, I had this beautiful relationship, this beautiful soul, this wonderful heart in my life, and boom, it was gone. And he said, you know what your problem is? You know, and I, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm never going to like the, what your answer is going to be. And I says, no, but I'm sure you're going to tell me, right? And he said, you're not grateful. Mm. And in that moment, I said, what the... I got to be grateful for, right? But I realized how loud I said it because everybody in the restaurant stopped talking, the plates stopped clanking. I went, oh no, there's kids in here. Dog got it. But that was a turning point for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I was going to say, you know what's so beautiful about your story and just life in general is how we have these like crucial moments in our life that can completely change the tra trajectory of how we're going. And in your life, it's, you know, missing your daughter's birth, her showing you um, the, like the job for um, the boy's facility. And here, when he's like, you 
aren't grateful, which at the moment you're like, huh? And you're like, what are you saying? But you know, we have these moments in our life that can completely change the trajectory of where we're going if we let them in a good way, right? Obviously they're the ones that go the opposite way, but it's just so beautiful how you take each of these opportunities that are thrown at you and you internalize them and reflect on them and allow them to make a positive impact in your life or on your perspective on life. And I just think that's just such a great quality to have. Thank you. And I want to comment on even when it goes bad or goes sideways, we have challenges. We, we all do, right? We, we have these hurdles, these mountains, we have to climb these challenges. And what I tell people is let's address them. This is an opportunity for me to use my tools that, and if I use my tools and I come out the other side of it, there's growth there, right? Every time I have to face a challenge and I have to use tools and don't don't handle my challenges and difficulties the same way I used to, um, either by getting loaded or bounce, right? And when I don't do that, I grow in that. So even hard stuff, yeah. if we continue to work on ourselves, and and try to move forward there's there's real positive stuff there although we might not see it at the time right because you know change some people see change as linear but really you have to think of change as you know up and down up and down but it goes in an upward trajectory but it's not as straight as one would like just because one day is not hasn't been as good as the rest of the days it doesn't mean you're not improving it just means that True. day was maybe not your best day but that's as long right. as you continue on that tr upward trajectory even if it's not a straight line that's really what's important because it can be hard um because obviously everyone wants to just be able to immediately feel uh the improvement or look how far i've gone but it's it's hard work but as long as you're trying your best in the process every small change counts yeah and Maria, you make a fantastic point that I want to talk about for a minute. Uh, recovery is not linear. It is, I know very few people, maybe just two or three in my life that have gone from A to Z, right? Mm -hmm. With Without some sort of setback, it, it generally doesn't happen. So what I like to do, it, it get up on my whiteboard and I tell people that I can start here six months in, let's say I fall down, I have a bad weekend, I come down, right? And what I always ask people, shame is um, a soul wrenching, sucking emotion. Um, there's no room for shame, right? Um, or guilt. What I ask people to do is, what'd you learn, right? What did we take away? What was going on when we fell down, right? Forget the shame and forget the guilt. Let's let's think about this like a homework assignment. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to steal this from Mad Men, right? If I can, if I can remove the emotion, then it's just a problem to be solved, right? Yeah. And solve that problem. So what happens is if I'm here and I've fallen and I've learned why I fell, right? Well, then I come up, I'm actually above the line because of the growth and what I learned. So as we go on, I always call this like the nine, nine month, 12 month trap. Yeah. Nine months a year in, you're doing great. You're feeling good. Your relationship's better. Your, your kids are happy to see you. The job's going well. You have money in your pocket you haven't had before. Things are going fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then you stop doing everything that got you there, right? This happens a lot. Um, we all get complacent. We get comfortable and we forget. And let's say at 12 months, we, we have at a year in, we fall down again. And again, people, you will hear people say, you got to start over. Um, part of my language, but it's bullshit. And I agree because you already know how to make that improvement. You already yes. went through the process. Yes, it's going to feel bad that you, you know, that you went down. But like you said, it's a learning opportunity to avoid going down in that same way again. And you already yes. know how to go up. So then you'll just keep going and you won't go into that hiccup again. If there's another hiccup, you'll learn from it. But then again, you know how to start, you know how to go back up. And it, every time you go back up, it'll be a little less hard because you know how to. And yes. I just think that's such a, a, that's also such a great point because it's so hard to be really, be, it, because it's really hard to be hard on oneself when yeah. what, when things are not going how we want but then it always takes perspectives like this to realize you've done more growth than you think you have you yes. Know? yes 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 good job Maria outstanding you know the silly analogy I use for that is if I start on the corner walking 
and I walk 10 feet and there's a piece of concrete that's that's sticking up and I trip and I fall down over it. I stand up, I brush myself off, figure out why I fell down and go, oh, okay. Then I keep going. I don't go back to the curb and start all over again. Yeah. And you were so right. You bring that experience with you. I've had guys and gals who have had lengthy, lengthy periods of sobriety and then relapse and fall off. But I always tell them, you didn't lose all that wisdom and insight and knowledge that you had for 10, 15, 20 years. You were doing something right right? You were doing something right. So let's remember what we were doing and sort of just double down on those tools again. Um, that's say, a great point, Maria. Yeah. And I will say that in general, I think this happens in a lot of things in life, regardless of what one's goal is, but there's something about recovery that I think makes you even be harder on yourself because maybe you feel that other people are judging you or you feel that you have failed versus if it be with another goal that someone else might have and they fail at it. I think it's easier for that person to go back up because they don't have that stigma affecting them about like, oh, look how you fell, you know, yeah. versus having those eyes on you and feeling maybe self-conscious about the fact that you fell that's also hard but and then finding people that will help you get up is really important and that won't judge you by falling down and and it's and it's there and that yeah. guilt and that shame um so for me um i i'm an old guy and i'm trying to learn new things um i've been for a long time an abstinence only guy um however harm reduction, whatever it takes to get you there, to keep you alive for the seed to take hold, for that hook to get a hold of you, right? We, we got to keep you alive first um, before we can provide treatment. So I've, I've kind of moved off of that a little bit. Um, and I just forgot where I was going with that. Um, I, I get excited and then I, um, I forget where I was going. Apologies. Um, we were talking about the guilt that one might feel when falling down yes yes thank you thank you yeah. so um i'm kind of a traditional um aa and na person um i have found love and compassion and support around the tables and what we think the way the disease right talks to us is first of all the disease wants to get us alone it wants to kill us i saw matthew perry say that last summer in an interview um and it's absolute truth so we're afraid to go to the tables, back to the tables, thinking we're going to get judged, thinking that we're going to get ridiculed, whatever it is. But what we're going to find is just the opposite, because there's nobody sitting around those tables that hasn't been where you are right now, right? And the the meetings are the same all over the world. Um, if I can tell a quick story. Uh, so I was in Ireland. Um, my daughter, bless her heart. Um, had bought me a trip to Ireland. Um, I went over to Ireland. The last night there, we were in Dublin and we were getting ready to leave. And I thought, how cool would it be to, to catch a meeting, an AA meeting in Ireland? How great would that be, right? So back then, this was still the, um, the dial-up where it sounded like the robot was being tortured, right? And um, so I we dialed up. I found an address, found out how to get there. It was about a mile or so from the hotel. And it was hard at night because in Europe, in Ireland, there aren't street signs. The street signs are on the buildings, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had a hard time seeing it. So I got to the address. I was looking at it and there was this bombed out building that hadn't been used in years. So I got back to the hotel room and um, I called up the hotline and it was about eight o'clock, 8.30 at night. And I said, are there any other meetings in town? And she goes, no, there's there's really not. She apologized profusely. That, that meeting really needs to be taken off the list. And here's the next, the next question that um, has stuck with me for more than 22, 23 years. She said, are you okay? Do you need me to send somebody over to the room? You're going to be okay tonight, right? And I thought... You know, she obviously knew I wasn't Irish from my accent and um, and I was from out of town and she her first question was, are you OK? Mm -hmm. Right. And um, that is the love and support that I find around the tables. Yeah, and it's a sense of community. Absolutely. And 
again, I'm going to circle back to something I mentioned earlier was we're all different, right? We're generationally, we're different with different backgrounds, experiences. But again, the one thing we all have in common sitting around those tables is pain, suffering, and loss. And we all have an intimate understanding of all of that, right? And so when, when I know what my pain is um, and what suffering is like and loss is like for me, I can help somebody else. I can say, yeah, I, I, I know. I know how hard this is, right? And I know I, I repeated that. I'm repeating that a little bit, but that that's what it all is. a message, to. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And for anyone listening or viewing this right now who are thinking about recovery or in the process of recovery or even not interested in recovery at all, just what what advice do you have for them? What's one message that you really want them to take from this? Yeah, hope. Hope. Don't lose hope. Don't give up hope. Um, look, if you're watching this, I guarantee you I'm not any smarter than you are than you. I'm not a, I don't have any more wisdom or insight. I have some experience, but hope, don't lose hope. Things do get better, maybe not right away. And, it, and in some cases, depending on what our circumstances are, it gets a little bit harder, but it does get better. Um, I'm not supposed to be here, right? Um, the way I live my life, uh, most of my wedding party is dead. Um, men that I cared about and love are, are gone and dead. Um, due to this disease, most most of it by the time I was thirty, um, I want I want to give people this message of hope. And if if you're struggling right now, um, Maria, I had a coworker who's an artist. I'm not going to take credit for it. She put a butterfly up on my board, and it's beautiful. It, it's just beautiful. But I think butterflies and moths are really symbolize what recovery is. So if I can talk about that just for a minute. Yes, yes, we have time. So moths, moths, I actually like moths better. And and this story, if anybody's curious, if you've ever seen the, the series Lost, the first season, I think it's the seventh or eighth episode, there is um, a character in there who, who had an opiate addiction. And he was going to run out. Right. They were stranded on this island and he was going to run out. And so um, he was working with an older gentleman and he told him the story about the moth. And moths, like just on this continent, there's like 5,000 different varieties. And when they're getting ready to transform, um, they, they're kind of a pile of goo. They're a mess. Right. But if I'm out in the woods, and I see a chrysalis hanging from the bottom of a branch of a cocoon. And I know it's a moth cocoon. I could help that moth. I could enable that moth, right? I can pull out my buck knife, whip the end out, and the moth will come right out. But that moth will be dead in two or three hours because that moth needs that struggle to build up the strength to carry that big, substantial body, especially moths or even butterflies. Monarch butterflies do migrations all the way from Mexico to Maine, right? And for them to do those migrations, they have to go through that struggle to build the strength to survive and live. So what is what is what the hell does that have to do with anything we're doing here? I think, and I'm still talking to those folks, you folks who are struggling, right? Don't lose hope because here's the thing. Somehow in the midst of your addiction, in the midst of your alcoholism, you've still somewhat kind of made things work. Um, I had somebody I worked with that had three little girls, had two jobs, paying a mortgage, car payment. And somehow with all those balls in there, including addiction and alcoholism, made it work somewhat, right? It wasn't great, um, but she was still making it work. Here's the thing. You have been tempered and strengthened in ways that you're not you're not aware of just yet. You are way stronger than you know. There's there's an old story, and I'm going to go off the moss story here just for a minute. That if you took a person who who was grew up who's fine, who's no, I, I hate using the word normal, but doesn't have this disease, and an addict, and you drop them off at the Canadian border, who's going to get home in time for supper? My money's always going to be on the attic. You're, they're going to figure it out. They're going to figure out a way to get this done and get home in time for supper. There is a resiliency 
um, resourcefulness um, and an intelligence to be able to think about chasing and running. You got to figure out how you're going to make all these pieces work every single day and, and the chaos and everything else. You're stronger than you know. Um, don't lose hope. Don't give up hope. Um, there's a lot of us here who, if I wasn't doing this professionally, I would, you know, and I still do, I do it personally. Um, and can I circle back to something you said earlier, Maria? Of course. You, you had mentioned about um, detoxing and um, how difficult it is. Um, earlier this year, I sat with a young man. Um, ERs wouldn't take him. There's no detox centers in the area um, that he could get to. He didn't have insurance. So he was going to kick heroin at his mother's house. Um, his mother was terrified. Um, we were old friends from decades back. Afraid that he was going to die. And I said, as long as he's hydrated, he's not going to die, not from heroin. Um, but I said, it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be very, very difficult. So I talked to him. He had already said, I'm already started. It was about a day in. Um, so I went and, and where I worked, they're wonderful. I went and stayed with them for about four days. Um, second day in is when most people quit because that's when it gets hard, second to third day in. Um, second night, he moaned for about six to eight hours, um, and it it was bad. So one of the things with heroin withdrawal is you're kind of going from both ends. Um, he was throwing up. Um, wasn't so much the other end, which I was grateful for, but that's what I was there for. And I had done this before, and I had some experience with this, but it still didn't make it any easier because I knew this. I knew this young man when he was a little boy, when he was a little five-year-old, blonde, toe-head little boy, right? And he was just this cute little kid. And to see him, um, his name was Christian, and to see him as a young adult struggling with this, but he wanted to do it. So it took so much courage for him to do that. It's not a happy ending. Um, he passed in March, and, um, you know, I... I wish I had said this, what I said earlier at the wedding, that I'm no hero, right? That I sat with this young man. I sat with him because I knew him as a boy and I loved him and I care very much. I love his mother. She's a wonderful human being. But this is what we do for one another in recovery because I've had this done for me. This is what we do for each other. Uh, we love and care for each other when the large corporations don't care. Um, I care. We care. Um, there's a whole community of people that want to see you get healthy, that want to see you come out the other side of this. Um, and you're not broken. You don't have a character flaw. You don't have a moral failing. You have a disease. You have a disease that needs to be treated. It can be arrested. It can be arrested, right? But this is where support and love comes in. Um, let, let people love you. And here's the thing. I had people hold me up when I couldn't hold myself up. I had my parents say, we love you, but you can't stay here. I had to make a decision. I didn't have a soft place to land any. They, they were gone. I'd used all that up, right? Mm. So don't lose hope. Don't, don't lose hope. Ask for help. And if you can get a hold of somebody in recovery, we'll be there. We'll help. I mean, I don't want to speak for the community, but I know they were there for me. Yeah, it's a supportive community, right? And going back with your metaphor, they'll help your wings come, right? Is that where you were going yeah. with the butterflies? Yeah, sorry, I kind of I kind of got off. Oh of no. I love that... we, I think we both like to make like three stories out of one story. We're the same way <laughs> going all over, but I we're following each other. <laughs> okay. But the I I think the whole thing behind the butterfly story is you're stronger than you know, right? You have been through what most people can barely imagine, right? And here's the other thing. Your instincts and intuition have been honed in a way that most people that don't need it to survive don't understand, right? You have a highly tuned instinct and intuition. Um, believe it and trust it. What I always tell my folks early in recovery when they're struggling with decisions, how many times have you second-guessed yourself out of a right decision, right? Trust your instincts, trust your intuition because it's kept you alive through probably some pretty hairy um, circumstances. So trust it. 
and trust yourself. And that I think that is the hard part. And one more thing, Maria, I, you had mentioned about falling down the negative self-talk, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's one of my biggies. Um, I, uh, I work on that. I think it's one of the top one or two or three things that we have to get a handle on because if I'm walking around all day saying I am a, a, a right, why wouldn't I go out and use? Why wouldn't I? Um, we have to change that dialogue in here. Mm -hmm. um, you, you are, you have survived. Um, yeah. So survive. And I, I always tell folks, don't give that conversation life. So thoughts are so powerful, really just, it's so important. We don't realize how much our internal monologue, how our thoughts and our perceptions of ourselves really influence us. Because yes. we're not, if all we see is someone who is failing or someone who is not good enough, then you're not, we're not going to be able to grow because we internalize those thoughts, right? So it's hard yes. to to go through that process, but it's so important to change our, the way we view our, our journey and the way we view ourselves to be able to continue growing. Because if not, we're going to be stuck or having to go back in circles, right? So, yes. it's, so it's a really hard thing to change though, the way we think about ourselves, but it's so important. I have a tool for that. Oh, perfect. Um, so what I do, for folks that are brand new, um, gratitude and affirmations. Now the gratitude, just write down three things that you're grateful for. And that's usually not real hard for folks, but I try to get folks to think about it paradoxically, right? Um, so for example, about once a week, I do a get to list. I get to pay taxes. I get to go to work. I get to make a house payment. I get things we wouldn't think about being grateful for, but I am grateful for it because I'm in recovery. The other thing is an affirmation list. I have folks list three positive traits that you like about yourself. Now, early in recovery, this is hard. So I said, do this for me. I'm going to help you out. Mm -hmm. Three times a day, just write it three times a day. I'm worth it or I'm worthy. You write that for two weeks, check in bit with me, and let's see what else we got and what else we can do. You just, just write it down for two weeks that I'm worth it and I'm worthy. Um, we have to change that dialogue. And the other thing I tell folks is... Um, once in a while, I don't do it very much anymore, but I'm a flipping idiot, right? I stop that conversation. I don't give it life. I don't let it take a breath. Or and that's not accurate. I'm not. Because if I don't, then I travel down that path all the times I really was, right? So we have to stop that in its tracks. And I think okay. this is so important. It's so yeah. important to folks. How we, and you're right, Maria, how we talk to ourselves matters. It really matters. It matters. Yeah. So the goal is I hear that thought. I'm going to stop it in the moment to not let yes. it power over me and to challenge it, reinforce the good things fighting against the thoughts. So that is so, that is so, um, that is so helpful. I think a lot of people will appreciate that. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for being here with us on Saturday night chat with Wisconsin Voices for Recovery. We really appreciate it. And again, for any, anyone hearing, have hope. Hope is so important. And that's, if we, there's one thing we want you to get away from this conversation is that there is hope, there is light at the end of that tunnel. Um, so thank you for joining with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Maria. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>